So in the last module we discussed uh, basic cache optimizations and now we are going to look at some advanced uh, optimizations to the cache memory. So previously we considered the techniques to reduce the hit time, reduce the miss rate and reducing the miss penalty. But now we also add the bandwidth improvement techniques and the power minimization techniques to this list. So first we start with reducing the hit time. So to reduce the hit time, we will consider small and simpler caches. We also consider a technique called as wave prediction. And for uh, increasing the cache bandwidth, we consider pipeline caches, non-blocking caches and multi-bank caches. To reduce the missed penalty, we look at techniques such as critical word first, early restart, merging write buffers and for reducing the miss rate we look at compiler optimizations optimization from the software not from the hardware itself and also we look at uh, the prefetching techniques both the software and the hardware prefetching techniques for reducing the miss penalty or miss rate so we start with hit time reduction techniques So we know that the cache consists of the tag array, data array, a decoder and set of other components for uh, performing a read or write operation on it and it supplies the data to the processor. So from the time the processor issues address to the cache to the time at which the cache supplies the data. So there are several components involved in it and each of these components are going to consume some time and the overall time is going to determine your hit time. So effectively cache access consists of going through the set decoding, tag comparison, data read and data out. When I say tag comparison it consists of tag array read and then comparing with the tag in the address of the memory request. So effectively, if the size of the cache is large, automatically our word line length will be increased and bit line length will be increased and similarly the decoder width can increase and because of all these things our overall access time is going to increase. To reduce the cache access time, we have to reduce each of these things. But before that, we look at what is the actual access time for a given size of the cache with a given associativity. To do that, we actually consider a tool from HP, it's called as a cacti, and which actually provides the access times for the cache memory as well as the DRAM based memory. And it also provides area as well as the energy consumption. And this energy values will be given for each of the components in the cache. So first we start with the access time. And here this graph shows different sizes of the caches starting from 16 KB to 128 KB. And uh, we considered one way that is a direct map cache, a two way, four way and eight way associative caches. And we also assume that the entire cache is a single bank and uh, so we consider one read write port per bank. And we model the entire cache using 32 nanometer process technology. Remember for different process technologies, the access times and the energy values are different. So for our calculations, we consider 32 nanometer process technology. From the graph, we can clearly see that for a fixed size cache, for example, consider a 16 KB cache, if I increase the associativity, the access time is increasing. And similarly, for a fixed associativity, for example, consider a two-way associative cache, and as I increase the size of the cache, access time is increasing. That says that, Having a simple 
cache with a sm the size of the cache is small then we are going to get a better hit time but remember if I reduce the size of the cache or if I reduce the associativity of the cache, the capacity misses or the conflict misses can increase. So effectively, when you want to freeze in a particular associativity and the size, you have to look at all these things also into consideration. So as I mentioned earlier, that the entire computer architecture course is effectively a design space exploration. You have to explore all these things and then finally come up with a better design point. So because these decisions have to be taken before, much before actually fabricating the chip. So for these things, for modeling these things, we typically use simulators. And in this particular case, we consider a cacti tool. So this shows that access time is reduced if I consider a small size cache with a smaller associativity. Now we look at the energy point of view. Again, we consider only the dynamic energy. Whenever we perform any access, this access is going to consume some energy and that energy is called as the dynamic energy. If I increase the size of the cache for a fixed associativity, the energy is increasing. The reason is as the size of the cache increases, because our the bit lines as well as the decoder length is going to increase and that is actually contributing to the increased dynamic energy. And similarly, if I consider a fixed size cache but I increase the associativity, then also the energy is increasing. This is mainly because our, as the associativity increases, our word line length is going to increase and that is actually contributing to more energy. And also another point is because here we are considering accessing both the tag and the data simultaneously as the associativity increases our data access energy contributing to the overall dynamic energy is increased. So this also shows that to reduce the overall energy of the cache, we have to go for a smaller and a simpler caches. By the way, the details about the Cacti tool and uh, how to download and the technical report about the Cacti tool, how it works and so on are uh, available in this particular website and it is an open source tool. Anyone can download and uh, uh, play with the cache simulator for different configurations and you can see so how each component in the overall cache contributing to the, the overall energy and the overall access times and so on. So the second technique to reduce the hit time is a prediction mechanism. Consider an 8-way associative cache. We know that if, if at all the data is present in the cache, it will be present in a particular set that too only one way of that particular set. So once we know that the data can be there at most in one way, why are we accessing all the ways? If you are going to access only one way, we can perform this in a direct map mechanism. So accessing one way is going to take less amount of time compared to accessing all the ways. But to do this, our prediction mechanism should be very accurate. As long as our way prediction mechanism is accurate, we are going to reduce the overall hit time. But what happens if our prediction is wrong? When the prediction is wrong, then we have to search all the other ways of that particular selected set to see whether processor requests can be serviced by this cache or not. If even those other ways also incur some miss, then we have to go to the next level cache or the memory to supply the data. But now, the overall performance of this wave prediction technique depends on the prediction accuracy. Higher the accuracy, we can improve the hit rate significantly and the overall performance can be improved. If the accuracy is very bad, then automatically for most of the requests, we are going to incur multiple accesses. First is access for the direct mapped cache type of access and the second one is for all the remaining 
ways because this is going to increase the overall time because the first one is we are going to access a selected way followed by all the other ways as long as our prediction is giving a negative result. So, when we want to use this wave prediction mechanism, we have to come up with high accuracy wave prediction mechanisms. And whenever there is a misprediction, as I mentioned earlier, the overall hit time is going to increase significantly. And also, as long as the wave prediction is going to give you high accurate results, then we do not have to access the remaining ways in the data array portion of the cache that reduces our energy consumption also. And typically this wave prediction technique provide high accuracy in the case of instruction caches as instruction requests exploit more spatial locality. But in the case of data caches, requests may exhibit not so high spatial locality. So, the wave prediction techniques may not be effective. Now, we look at the pipeline caches to improve the overall bandwidth. So, we know that a cache access goes through several components. The first one is it will go to the set decoder, then the tag array access, then comparing the tags with the tag in the address and then access the data array and then read the data and finally apply the block offset to get the requested word. And effectively all these components are independent to each other. So, we can simply apply our pipelining concept. By the way, we are going to discuss this pipelining concepts in uh, the unit 3 that is fundamentals of pipelining and we will see how pipelining improves the overall throughput or the bandwidth. Of course, we consider the instruction pipelining there, but the pipeline concept can be applied for any component. So, here in this particular case, we apply the pipelining concept to the caches. So, we divide this entire cache into multiple pipeline stages and uh, two subsequent stages are separated with a pipeline register. So, whatever the data we read from one particular stage will be stored in the intermediate pipeline register and that will be given to the next stage and it continues. So, here in this particular case we consider a four stage pipeline, but if you consider different Intel processes, Pentium was using one stage pipeline. So, entire the cache was considered as a non-pipeline. Pentium Pro to Pentium 3 were using two cycle uh, pipeline cache because as the capacity of the cache increases, we know that the access time is going to increase and if we keep this entire thing as a single uh, pipeline cache, then it is having an impact on the processor frequency. To reduce the impact on the processor frequency, one option is we have to go for a pipelining of this cache and that is what they have considered in Pentium Pro to Pentium uh, 3. And in the Pentium 4, they were considering four cycle pipelines cache and uh, that is still continued even core i7 processors which are latest processors from Intel which also uses uh, four stage pipeline cache. Of course, it improves the bandwidth and also it gives an option for us to go for increased associativity in the cache especially when we are dealing with the parallel mode of access in the cache. When we have higher associativity, we discussed earlier with the increased associativity, the access energy is going to increase significantly. But when we consider a pipeline cache, because our tag array is accessed before the data array access. So, as a result, based on the hit specified by the tag array access, we are going to access only the required way in the data array portion of the cache. So, that the energy consumption will not be significant and that gives us an option to increase the associativity. So, there are advantages with the pipeline caches, but it also gives some disadvantages, especially in the case of branch mispredictions. And again, we are going to discuss this branch predictions, branch mispredictions when we come to 
the unit corresponding to exploiting instruction level parallelization. Because once we predict a branch that is going to take place and we fetch the instructions and pump these instructions into the instruction pipeline, but after some time if you realize that the predicted branch is incorrect, then automatically we have to flush the entire pipeline. But as we increase the pipeline stages for this cache, that also increases the overall pipeline stages of the entire processor. So as a result, our uh, penalty due to mispredictions in the branches is going to increase significantly in our uh, pipeline caches. So that's the reason why when we are considering this pipeline caches, we have to be careful enough to consider how many stages we have to consider so that branch misprediction penalty is not significant. So now we will consider non-blocking caches. So first consider a blocking cache where uh, when a processor issues a load or a store request, request goes to the L1 cache and if the L1 cache cannot supply the data for a load request from the processor, it sends the request to the memory and while the request is serviced from the memory, cache will not take any more requests from the processor. If the cache is working in this mode, then this is called as blocking cache. Cache is blocked for a previous request to be serviced. Until the previous request is serviced, the cache cannot take any more requests from the processor. And we know that servicing a request from the memory is going to take significant amount of time. So as a result, the blocking mode of cache degrades the processor performance significantly. And all the current processors are typically considered a non-blocking mode of operation. So what is a non-blocking cache? So consider an example where there are two load requests generated by the processor and then there is an add operation on the data of what we read from the previous load request. And assume a scenario where the first load request is a miss in the cache, but the second load request is a hit. So in the case of blocking caches, even when the second request is supposed to be hit in the cache, we cannot process this request. But when I consider an unblocking cache, while the previous request is a miss in the cache, the cache supplies this miss request to the memory. And while memory is supplying the data for this miss request from the cache, and the cache accepts the next request, that is load R2Y, and Y is a hit in the cache, so the second load request is a hit in the cache. So the cache supplies the data for the second load request to the processor. While it is transferring the data to the processor, memory supplies the data for the previous load request. To do this non-blocking operations, all we have to do is we have to maintain some set of buffers which are called as miss status handling registers. Whenever there is a miss in the cache, we report an entry in this MSHR and send the request to the memory. So all the requests which are miss in the cache will be reported in the MSHR and an entry is made in the MSHR. And based on the availability of the memory, MSHR will read one entry at a time in the order and it supplies this data request to the memory and memory will process that particular request. And whenever memory supplies the data, again this data is searched with the corresponding address in the MSHR and the matching entry will be deleted from MSHR and the data is supplied to the, the L1 cache. So as a result, we can improve the performance of the overall system. So it allows hits before previous misses. It is also called as a hit under miss or hit under multiple misses. And uh, we can improve the bandwidth by designing cache in a multi-bank way. For example, consider a cache which is designed as a single bank or a monolithic cache and there are several requests, load requests from the processor. And uh, we have considered this 
in this particular example, the cache is color coded and the request also color coded so that the color of a request which is matching with the a portion of the cache indicates that this request is satisfied by that particular portion of the cache. So when we have a single monolithic cache, so we have to service these requests one after another. Here the assumption is our cache can take at any point of time only one request. Of course, we can service multiple requests by using a single monolithic cache, but we need to have a support of multi ports. If you have multiple read ports for the cache, then the cache can service multiple requests simultaneously as long as these requests are not colliding with the same address or as long as these requests are not conflicting with each other. But the multi ported cache actually increases the overall energy as well as the access time. So maybe you can consider this cacti tool and uh, consider multiple ports and see what is the access time versus considering a single port. You can understand uh, the statement what I said previously that multi ported caches takes more access time as well as increases the access energy. So the other option is without increasing the energy as well as without increasing the access time, we can improve the bandwidth by dividing this cache into multiple banks like this. So we divided the cache into multiple banks so that the request generated by a processor will be stayed to a particular bank based on the address match. Of course, it is going to add a steering logic time. When a request comes from the processor, we have to see which bank the request can go and then we will send the request to the corresponding bank so that uh, that particular bank can service the request. Once we have four banks, this cache can service four requests simultaneously and each bank can have one port. So ports we are not increasing. So as a result, it is not increasing the access energy and access time. And since multiple banks can service the request parallelly, so we can improve the overall bandwidth. So if you consider Intel Core i7 processor, it supports four banks for L1 cache and eight banks for L2 cache. And as I said earlier, it reduces the power consumption associated with this multi-banking. So now consider another method, the critical word first. So in a normal the cache, when there is a miss in the L1 cache, we go to memory and memory is supplying the entire block of data to L1. So after the entire block is loaded into L1, then L1 cache supplies the requested word to the processor. And consider a scenario where our block size is 64 bytes. So until the data is available from the memory to the L1, L1 cannot supply the data to the processor. But actually processor is waiting for only 64 bits of data and it is not waiting for the entire 64 bytes of data to be transferred from memory to the cache. So as a result, what we can do is when the request is sent to memory from the L1 cache, we identify the location in the particular address location. We identify the corresponding block in the memory and we will go to that particular block and we take the requested word and transfer this word to the L1 cache and which in turn supplies this requested word to the processor. While it is transferring, the remaining words will be transferred one after another. Remember, memory cannot supply all 64 bytes of data in single cycle to the L1 cache. It happens a bit by bit. It typically transfers a couple of words in one cycle and then reads the next couple of words of data and so on. So as a result, there is a serialization happens when we are reading the data from memory block in the memory. So it is going to take significant amount of time and to minimize this penalty, the miss penalty, we can supply the requested word that is the critical word which is required by the processor as early as possible so that processor can resume operations of the following requests 
while the memory is supplying the remaining things. So we are effectively overlapping memory transfer time with the processor computation time so that the overall CPU time can be reduced. This is one way of doing that. The other one is we can go for early restart. Without reordering our the byte transfers, we continue transferring the data from memory to the cache byte by byte in the sequence. But as and when we come to the critical word that is required by the processor or the, the word which is addressed by the processor, we supply that to the L1 cache and L1 cache immediately transfers that data to the processor. So that we can overlap the remaining byte transfers from the memory to the L1 cache with the processor computation. So the early restart is simple to implement, but it may not overlap the operation significantly. Whereas the critical word first overlap memory transfer time with the CPU computation time, but it is a bit complex. You have to reorder the things and you have to locate the critical word and then transfer that and place that in an appropriate location in the cache block and then rearrange the remaining words coming from the memory into the, the cache. So the operations are a bit complex in the critical word first. But anyway, so the benefits of this critical word first are early restart, especially it depends on the block size as well as the chance of having further requests into the remaining portion of the block which is not a transferred from the memory. If the block size is let us say a one word, you do not need a critical word first or early restart. Of course, a one word block we are not we are not going to consider because of the performance reasons and so on. Because to exploit the spatial locality, we typically consider multi-word blocks. Because as the block size increases, our transfer time increases. So if we send the critical word first, we can improve the performance. And again, for example, if the processor is requesting the last word of a cache block, which incurred a miss in the L1 cache, so we send the request to the memory and uh, we are supplying the critical word first. That is the last word is supplied to the cache first and which in turn supplies the data to the processor. So processor is going to resume with the remaining operations. But the remaining operation is another load request which is to the first word of that particular block and which is not at transferred. So then what is going to happen is the processor is again incurring another miss and so on. So effectively like this all depends on the overall performance of these two techniques depends on the block size as well as what is the, the probability that the processor generates a request to the non-transferred words of this particular block. So another way to reduce the miss penalty is considering the merging write buffers. We already discussed the write buffers. Typically the size of the write buffer is very limited maybe it consists of 4 entries or 8 entries and each entry can store 464 bits data. Now consider a scenario where we have a 4 entry write buffer and each entry is storing 8 words of data and each word is 64 bits here. Now processor generated write requests and these are to different addresses. One is address location 100. The next one is address location 108, 116, 124. And assume that our cache is designed as a write through cache. So whenever we are performing these write operations, so we are writing to the L1 cache as well as we are writing to the write buffer between L1 and the L2 cache. So as and when the processor issues a request for address location 100, we write to the corresponding location in the cache and also we dedicate one entry for this address location 100. After that, a processor generated a next write request which is to the address 108. It will be written to the cache in the appropriate location and also the next entry is allocated in the write buffer and the data is written to that particular thing. Similarly, there are two more requests. After four requests, no more space is there in the write buffer so that if there is any further write request from the processor, 
we cannot continue further unless we make some room in the right buffer. To make a room in the right buffer, now we have to take an entry from the right buffer and write it to the lower level caches and free that entry so that processor can resume with the subsequent write requests. So this is a normal way of uh, performing operations on the write buffers. But if we provide some intelligence to our processor such a way that whenever there is a next request comes from the processor, we just compare that address with the modified entry in the write buffer to see whether this address can be merged with the previous addressed data. So that is called as merging write buffers. If you see this example, the processor is writing to the address location 100, under address location 108, 116 and 124. So if we merge all these things and uh, still we can say like the processor is writing to address location 100 but to different components in that and all these are contiguous. So we just give one entry in the write buffer so that the remaining three entries in the write buffer are free. And whenever L2 cache is free, we take this entry and we write all these things together to the L2 cache. Also writing a large chunk of data to the lower level caches is much efficient compared to writing one word at a time. So that way also we can reduce our overall miss penalty. So when storing to a block that is already pending in the write buffer, update the write buffer. So this is the overall idea of uh, merging write buffer concept. But this technique cannot be applied for IO addresses because the addresses of IO registers are not contiguous in memory. So as a result, we cannot apply for uh, the IO addresses. And this write merging is typically applied only for the addresses which are contiguous in the memory as like uh, the example shown in this file address 100, 108, 116, 124, these are contiguous and uh, we can apply our write merging peacefully for this. So in order to improve the overall performance, we can also take the help from the software. So that is, we can exploit compiler optimizations in uh, improving the performance of the cache memory. A simple example is, loop interchange. Consider a case. We have an operation performed on two dimensional array where we have a, a nested loop for j equal to 0, j less than 100, j plus plus, for i equal to 0, i less than 5000, i plus plus, x of ij equal to 2 into x of ij. The data is stored in the memory in such a way that it follows this order x00, x01, x02 and so on x099, then x10, x11, x12 and so on x199 and it continues. When we store the data in that order in the memory, but if we apply this particular code, what is going to happen is we access x00 first, then we are going to access x10. Note that x00 and x10, these two are separated by 100 words gap. And these 100 words gap cannot fit into a single cache block. So as a result, we incur a miss for the second request and then we have to bring in that block into the cache and then supply the data to the processor to perform this operation. So as a result, the spatial locality cannot be exploited efficiently if we consider this particular piece of code. To increase the spatial locality, we can just interchange these loops so that the for loop with i equal to 0, i less than 5000 will come first followed by for loop j equal to 0, j less than 100, j plus plus. So as a result, we now request the data which is like x00, x01, x02 and so on. So when we bring in a block of data to service first data item, 
we also bring in subsequent multiple the elements of that array so that when a processor requests that particular data it will be hit in the l1 cache and which improves the overall performance and uh, typically most of the scientific applications you can see there are so many loops and the compiler can optimize these loops efficiently also we can consider the blocking mechanism so consider a matrix multiplication so in this the elements of matrix z are repeatedly accessed and then the elements of the other two matrices and in this particular example we consider color coding where the dark shaded blocks indicates that these are the elements in the matrix which are recently accessed and the light shaded ones are accessed but not so recently and the white blocks indicates that these are the elements not accessed at all in those corresponding matrices so effectively if i consider a normal matrix multiplication then uh, so our accesses will be all over the arrays and as a result caches cannot exploit the locality and the cache space cannot be efficiently utilized to perform these operations but whereas if i consider matrix multiplication in a block matrix multiplication method where we divide the matrices into smaller blocks and we perform the multiplications on those things and if you do that then our uh, access patterns will be confined to smaller regions in the uh, the memory so that these accessed elements can be efficiently kept in the cache memory which can improve the locality and uh, cache performance can be improved significantly and finally we can consider a prefetching method what is prefetch prefetch is fetch the data before the processor requests that particular data typically when our processor wants the data it issues a load request to the cache so that the cache will look at that address and search in that cache with that particular address and if the data is available in the cache so it supplies the data to the processor if the data is not there for that particular address location in the cache it goes to the next level and which may take several cycles and meanwhile processor is sitting idle to reduce this penalty we can actually issue this load request early in advance but for that we need to predict which are the load requests processor is going to generate in future so for that we can take the help of hardware or software effectively we can come up with hardware prefetching techniques or software prefetching techniques in the case of hardware prefetching techniques we can consider stream based prefetching or stride based prefetching we provide extra hardware with the processor and this hardware keeps track of what is the access patterns that happens for the given application when it is executing on the processor and these access patterns can exhibit stream based accesses or stride based accesses depending on the aggressiveness of the prefetching it can either prefetch one block or it can prefetch multiple blocks and so on so typically this prefetching happens at a granularity of cache block when there is a miss happens for one particular block if it is a st stream based prefetching it prefetches subsequent blocks to that particular address in the case of stride based prefetching sometimes applications access not the contiguous locations but with a fixed stride distance in the stride based prefetching is typically the access patterns are following a particular stride a stride of 10 bytes a stride of 20 bytes stride of 100 bytes or something so our hardware prefetching unit captures this stride difference and whenever there is a miss to a particular addressed block this hardware prefetching unit which is implementing stride based prefetching adds the stride difference to the the previously missed address and it prefetches the corresponding block into the cache so that when the processor actually requests the data the data is available in the cache 
So as long as the prefetching method is working fine, processor can improve performance significantly because all processor requests can get a hit in the cache memory. But too much aggressiveness applied in the prefetching can result into performance penalty also. Effectively, if your prefetching logic is not efficient, this is going to pollute the cache which in turn increases overall miss rate. So as a result, we need to come up with efficient prefetching methods such that there is no significant pollution in the cache and also the processor when it requests the data, the data is available. So without increasing the conflict miss rate of the useful data, we have to keep our prefetched blocks into the cache. And also another reason, another thing we have to consider with the prefetching logic is because the prefetch requests can be competing with actual demand requests from the processor when we are accessing the L2 cache, memory and so on. So again, we have to give priority for demand requests as processor is waiting for this demand request to be serviced as early as possible than servicing the prefetch request. And another reason is we are not sure whether the prefetch request may be actually required by the processor in the future and so on. So we have to keep all these things into consideration when we are dealing with the prefetching logic. And the current processors have this hardware prefetchers at L1 and L2. And because this prefetching can sometimes degrade the performance, so these processors also provide a mechanism to turn off this prefetching. So we can turn off the prefetching and then execute in a normal way. If the applications are going to exploit the benefits of this prefetching, then we can turn on in those cases. So this is about the hardware prefetching, but we also have software prefetching where the compiler can insert this prefetch request by looking at the access patterns. So the advantage with the software prefetching is we don't have to incur extra hardware. But the disadvantage is it is going to increase your instruction count. So once we have this software prefetching, we can actually apply the software prefetching either for prefetching the data into the cache or prefetching the data into a register. If you are prefetching the data into a register, it is called as a register prefetching. If you are prefetching data into a cache, it is called as a cache prefetching. And uh, we can also apply the software prefetching along with other compiler optimizations such as loop unrolling and software pipelining. Loop unrolling is a concept where a loop is unrolled. For example, if I have a for loop for i equal to 0 to i equal to 100, i plus plus, a of i equal to b of i into c of i. So what I can do is I can unroll the loop by 5 times such that my for loop will be for i equal to 0, i less than 100, i plus equal to 5 and the body of the for loop will become like a of i equal to b of i into c of i. Next instruction will be a of i plus 1 equal to b of i plus 1 into c of i plus 1 and so on. Effectively, previously we considered one instruction in the body of the for loop in the, the original the loop, when we unroll the loop 5 times, we inserted 5 instructions in the body of the for loop and reduce the, adjust the, the loop iterations accordingly. And uh, we can exploit the cache benefits when we apply this loop unrolling. So this is a simple technique, typically most of the, the current day compilers apply to improve the overall performance in executing the loops. And in addition to that, we can also apply software pipelining. The software pipelining is similar to a hardware pipelining where, for example, the loop body of a for loop has a dependency in executing the instructions. Now when we apply software pipelining, we can unroll the loop to a certain extent and then exploit the independent instructions in this extended loop body 
so that once we have independent instructions, we can perform these operations simultaneously. So this is a simple concept considered in uh, compilers as an optimization. So we can apply this software prefetching mechanism in addition to this loop unrolling and software pipelining to improve the overall performance. So with this, I am concluding this cache unit section. So thank you.